It can't be bargained with. It can't be reasoned with. It doesn't feel pity or remorse or fear. And it absolutely will not stop ever until you are dead. Welcome back to Thinking Critical. This is Wes. I've got a first time guest here on the channel. Very happy to have RJ from the fourth world visiting today. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the uh, the things happening in as far as the culture and fandoms around fantasy writing uh, in maybe some tabletop gaming type stuff, Dungeons and Dragons. And I definitely want to say thank you to the man behind Thomas Valiant, still available on Indiegogo. How you doing, RJ? I'm doing great. Thank you very much. I'm glad you could make it. And if people notice, there's a slight delay. It's because we are on opposite sides of the world, so there's a, a, the tiniest bit of delay. But I do want to get into something. Uh, I, I've seen it on your channel, and I've, I've uh, been very impressed with your content. I really appreciate uh, your point of view on these things. And it feels like it, it's something I've kind of talked about here on the channel. I'm talking about more and more. It's, you can't really take what's happening like within comics and movies and television or even within <clears throat> fandoms of like fantasy, all that personally, because it feels like to me, the people that have decided to come in and then label all of the things that you enjoy hateful and decide that they have to alter them and take them over for you. I don't think these people actually enjoy these hobbies for the most part. Maybe they have a little bit of enjoyment, but I think they're mostly in there just for the conquest and to take something away from somebody else. Yes, that's exactly what I did my last video on. Just came out last Saturday. I talked exactly about that. It's the fact that these people, their entertainment really is not these books or these games or these movies. Their entertainment is the destruction and watching people suffer who actually enjoy these things. And that's their entertainment. That's what they get pleasure from. They're not actually in it to play D&D. &D. They're not actually in it because they love Captain America or Spider-Man or Star Wars. They're in it because they want to see you as a fan go through the suffering because that's that's what they find pleasurable and a lot of people were saying about that video give me comments saying you just described narcissists that's what you did but you did it on a i don't know a scale for a society so yeah i i think these people really have, have um that problem and a whole lot more problems in the fact that they don't want to be here because they enjoy these things they want to be here because they enjoy watching others pain yeah, it's really interesting com concept. It almost feels like um, the way things have gone, it's almost like a government program. Have you ever heard of the Canadian Human Rights Commission? Yes. Okay, so you come up with a Canadian Human Rights Mission, and they're going to go out there and they're going to eradicate uh, you know, people being discriminated against, whether it's based on their race, you know, age, sex, uh, you know, any of that stuff. And you know what? Heck, I'm behind that. I'm sure RJ from the fourth world says, yes, I don't want people to be discriminated against for any reason whatsoever. So you create this commission, the Canadian Human Rights Commission, and we're just using this as an example of how these things uh, start and then they grow. And it has the best of intentions, RJ. There's no denying that. I can get behind what the initial premise of the Canadian Hi Rights Commission is. Well... It's funny you should mention that because in the area that I live in, sort of Eastern uh, North America, we get a lot of people right now that are actually fleeing from the areas where those commissions actually are uh, mostly implemented. And they're the, the people that they are, well, it's mostly Amish. It's mostly Amish people that are uh, actually coming from the central parts of Canada and trying to get out of there because um, these commissions actually are just stripping away everything that um, they want for their their lives, for their children, you know, just basically to, to be left alone. Um, and that's really, I think, the heart of what is going on here as well. Because honestly, I think that's a good uh, analogy. It's the Amish. They want to be left alone, right? And, and they're fleeing away from this. And we each in our our little fandom it's like can you not just leave us alone i mean i enjoy this thing and i enjoy the people who make these comics for me and i appreciate them but i just i i want to be left alone to some extent because you're not here to enjoy this you're not here to actually make it better you're here for a third purpose you're here for an additional purpose if you did originally come for your enjoyment of it it is long since gone and the purpose of it has become something completely different and um 
to some extent, uh, again, I think the popularity of science fiction, fantasy, tabletop gaming, comics, the comic book movies, that is the problem with a lot of, of what we have today. It's because it's out there and it's because it has such an eye on it, a public eye. Absolutely. So when you think about the Canada Human Rights Commission, uh, what you were just talking about there, it morphs into something else. It starts out and they go and they address the, the real problems out there, institutions or maybe companies that really are discriminating against people. And within a couple of years, because it's not, it's prevalent, but it's not so prevalent that you can't address it almost immediately. And if you have the, the power of the government behind your back, you throw some punitive measures on there and it's simply wiped out. But it's a government, you know, it's a government organization now. People's livelihoods depend on it. It's been monetized. So the mission has to grow. And so you're no longer just looking for discriminatory practices. It starts going into thought crime. How are you living your, your life? You were you, are you accept you, is your neighborhood even diverse enough? Well, who wanted to move in here? And they no longer think about the circumstances or the the motives behind your actions they start assigning motives to you and start pe penalizing you for things that you never even thought things that you never even wanted things that you never in your life intended to because the 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 mechanism itself in this case the analogy being the canadian human rights commission needs to be fed and once it's it's kind of churned through the things that were obvious and needed to be addressed, it needs to to add more things to it. Otherwise, it'll die out you know, on its own. And I think that's a lot of what we're experiencing, you know, within fandoms. Yeah, and one of the other things about that is that. Um, I'm always talking about virtue on my channel. My channel is centered around heroes. I want to discuss heroes, and I do that mainly through comics, but sometimes through other forms of entertainment. Um, but the idea of a hero, the, tr the traditional idea of a hero, because I have um, trained in basically history and uh, classics, which is ancient history and things like that. I go back to the ancient idea, a paragon of virtue, and that carried on through the ancients and the medievals and even into the modern day to some extent. But it's based upon individuality. And a lot of the mind think, the the mindset between behind these people, someone even like the the human rights commissions and these people who are trying to destroy our fandoms, the mindset is not an individual mindset. It's that you have to pay for someone else's wrongs. You have to pay for this and that. And it's always a communal mindset. And it's it's something that is very much against the idea of hero that has been set up in science fiction and fantasy and was the central point for almost every science fiction and fantasy book or game even because you're you're doing D D, right and it's like i want to be the hero it, it's my game and i want to be heroic and some people might want to just do it for the role playing but there is an element of i want to be an individual here and it's really key i think to understand Understanding it, this is their takeover is an imposition of the social upon everything. And that social crushes the idea of the individual. And it certainly crushes the idea of the individual enjoyment of whatever it is that you feel attached to in your fandom. Absolutely. All, everything about being a hero is making that difficult choice that maybe isn't the easiest thing for you, where you go out there and you decide that, you know, uh, to, to go and, and do the right thing, with, even when it's not in your own best interest. That's what being a hero is all about, making a personal sacrifice. And, you know, the collective is all about sacrificing other persons, but it's certainly not making personal sacrifice. It's something they really can't relate to. That's really funny because that's exactly it. Um, there is no pathos for these kinds of heroes or the heroes that they think they write. And uh, I get deep into um, comics and, and Marvel Comics specifically because they just love to talk over at Marvel Comics and just tell you exactly why they're ripping things apart. And one of the things that the, the vice president of character development said a couple of years ago was, yeah, we're going to create our quote unquote heroes. Uh, they, they call them heroes. I don't. Without pathos. They don't need to have this pathos. They don't need to have this moment of choosing. They don't need to have this individual reason to be a hero in the new way that they want to create heroes. And that's just the destruction of the idea of hero itself, if you ask me. Because everyone's a hero. It doesn't require sacrifice. I agree. Everyone that's why the heroes at Marvel, the new ones especially, there is no sacrifice. There's no failure. There's no personal introspection. And there's no growth. They just, who they are, 
They are who they are, and that's who they will always be. Indeed. No, that's exactly it. Because, <clears throat> excuse me, because they want these individuals that are portrayed as heroes as being something uh, where the world they live in warps and bends around them and affirms them. It's affirmation. It's it's not sacrifice and it's not heroic and, it, and it's not personal. And it's, it's affirmation of the characters and of the people supposedly that they think are reading these comics, which are your quote unquote progressive, what I always call woke or SJW kinds of people. Um, it's, it's, they want to affirm their worldview. That's, that's really what they want to do. And their worldview is one where sacrifice doesn't have to be made. And I'm sorry, but that's just not the way world, the world works. Absolutely not. And then I do want to talk about Tolkien. You know, obviously, we've seen a lot of things with, uh, you know, The Hobbit, Lord of the Rings, you know, the most prestigious works of uh, fantasy fiction in, in history. You started an entire genre. Obviously, J.R. Uh, Tolkien was uh, inspired by other works. Specifically, you, you hear a lot about Beowulf, but he was certainly a, a very well-read man. In his time, he stood for a lot of things. He certainly uh, was outspoken. Uh, against racism, he was outspoken against eugenics. He was outspoken in his personal life a lot about a lot of things, and you can you can see the words of the man in his life because they are documented on what he believed in. But people like to you because know, you got to take down monuments, right? And monuments aren't just statues; they're they're people, they're their reputations, they are their legacies. And you got a legacy like Tolkien out there, so people will go into his works now. They will find something, decide that's what the, that's what's offensive, because when I read about orcs, this is exactly what he must have been talking about. Even though if you, you listen to the words of the man or, or you, you read the, uh, the entirety of his works, that's not exactly what he's, he's going into there. But because you ascribed a, a potential thought crime to what Tolkien was doing 100 years ago, or less than 100 years ago, but... Several, several decades ago, all of a sudden he needs to be brought down. His reputation needs to be sullied. And anyone that ever appreciated his work is also just, you know, labeled a this and that because you must have been a part of that thought crime as well. Even though the originality, the original idea of what's wrong with it doesn't come from anyone that read it or the creator himself. I think that there is a real, um, I don't know how to put it exactly. Uh, this is my political science uh, training coming in. Um, the way that I look at things is, is that the instability that we see around us in the world today and that is being caused by this um, SJW woke takeover of our institutions and everything else, uh, I would say, in my estimation, it is caused by something that happened over the last number of decades where uh, in the 90s, you actually got more of the human race living in cities than in countries. And that was the first time that ever happened within human existence and it is something that detaches people from their origins detaches people from the reality of human existence when you get to live in these uh, major large cities which just every need is met and you don't have a connection to to a lot of uh, what nature is and one of the central themes that token draws from and that he wanted to explain was that exactly he saw the industrialization of the world coming and he saw taking over parts of the world that he lived in and knew as a boy and saw it coming in in a way that was destroying uh, that that simplicity and that um, real i guess well the hobbit nature of human beings really where you're in the shire and you have a secluded place that is close to nature and runs with uh an appreciation for both the people themselves and who they are and what is around them and the land and everything else. And he saw that destruction and that's what he based a lot of his central themes around and the orcs and the idea of their machinery and everything else coming in and destroying and cutting down forests and all these kinds of things. It's the destruction of the, the pastoral nature of the countryside, which he grew up in and you see that exactly playing out right here with these people that want to now destroy token and that want to destroy the idea because again the central point of this movement for these people is the cities these are city people i look at a lot of these things that these people talk about because i live in the country and they go on about environmentalism and i think to myself look i actually do most of the things you people 
keep on going on about, not because of my environmentalism, but because I live in the country and I'm tied to the land. And you do this because you live in the country. It's just something you do. They don't understand. They have no concept of what would actually work out in the country because they're stuck in their little bubbles and they're stuck in the city mindset and they think everything works and revolves around the cities. And so they want to destroy what the pristine nature is still today of um, what you have in the country. And that's one of the big dynamics that I think people are missing. It's city versus country in this is a uh, shift that's going on in our world today. And that's exactly what Tolkien talked about. That's exactly what the Hobbit and the Shire actually portray is the simplicity and the great simplicity of nature and how people can live in the country and, and I don't know, be separate from all those things that uh, might corrupt you. Yes. Well, besides that, that's, that's true. And, but the thing is that again, it is really funny to me. If you know the history of Tolkien and why he wrote and his themes and things like that, this is just an attack of the exact same nature that he described within his books and that made him write these things to begin with. This is another version of that same attack that he himself is describing through his works. And it's, it's interesting, as we mentioned earlier, it really doesn't have anything to be to do with Tolkien. They don't personally have anything wrong with him. They see an obstacle to scale, a monument to bring down. So you go through, you find a paragraph that, that confirms your belief all along. You shout it until everyone, uh, you know, the, the believers, I guess, come on board. And everyone else is just like, I don't want to hear this anymore. This is nuts. And then you get to topple them out, you know, with the, with the path of least resistance. Well, just by screaming and shouting obscenities and, and essentially lies about somebody else's work. I, I agree to some extent that is part of their movement. But I think Tolkien is a much, much bigger monument than they've ever tried to take down because his works have cemented generation after generation of young men and young girls i suppose too but in the fact that he has tied them to something that doesn't really exist in many forms within modern society traditionalism and a love of nature and simplicity and that the weak are the ones that are actually going to save the day i mean that's the whole point of lord of the rings and frodo and this is something that again is missing and has been missing for decades and decades at the very least if not a century within most of our societies but tolkien has been there and he has provided at the very least a window into this actual world that mankind should live within and should feel a connection to and since he has been so large and provided especially for young people a glimpse into that world and what could be if they just want to they want it enough and and embrace it enough they need to get rid of of especially his connection to the young and uh, that's one of the things i do go on about on my channel a lot but yeah that connection to to young men and to young women and the simplicity and nature and virtue and and honor and all that kind of things that is something they desperately want to destroy and Tolkien I think is one of the major uh, the, one of the largest um, icons and and just proprietors and patriarchs I guess we could call it of that kind of thinking yeah, it's interesting you think about um, you know the Hobbit itself the first novel that is written for a younger audience and you get Lord of the Rings when you grow up you graduate into Lord of the Rings so we you know the idea that uh, J.R.R. Tolkien would get them when they're young with The Hobbit and then keep their interest and, uh, you know, and keep them dreaming about way the way things could be all the way through The Hobbit and then, uh, or I'm sorry, The Lord of the Rings and some of his other works that he uh, produced certainly makes sense. And I'm sure you've noticed this. I, I believe you're, you're a father as well. I've got three kids now and, you know, kind of building on what some of the stuff you were talking about earlier about um, the, the interest in other people and wanting to control their lives. You wouldn't, I never expected when I became a father, so many people to be interested on how I'm raising my children, whether or not I'm, if I'm going to homeschool them, why I would ever do that, how I could ever even consider doing that, or you know, our sleeping arrangements, stuff like this. And one of the weird things I've, I've noticed, RJ, is a lot of the people that take the most interest and have the most passionate opinions 
and the, definitely want to let me know how I should be parenting, don't even have kids. That's really funny too, because um, there was something that happened in Marvel. I think it was last year um, where there are, trying to push um one of their teams i guess is not really the champions but it's kamala khan who is the new miss marvel and she's going to have something coming out on disney plus now but about a year ago they had a movie um a animated movie that was going on disney plus and they were talking about that and another animation show that was going on disney which was moon girl and devil dinosaur and you have this woman again the one that i talked about before the vice president of content and character development for marvel comics and she was specifically this this woman, by the way, who has no children, um, and she goes on to their podcasts and tells parents, and specifically talking to parents, saying, "Listen, uh, you got to teach your children that just because these are made for girls, that they need to like girl things. You need to teach your boys." that they need to like girl things. You need to sit them down in front of a television and say, this is what you like. And I'm thinking to myself, lady, where do you get off telling people that this is how they should parent their little children? And you have no concept of what parenting is. Um, it, it, it just boggles my mind that these people uh, want to do such a thing. And and I, I agree completely, but there was a, a video I did again in about a year and a half ago. It was about a book con, which Marvel took part in. And one of the, the I guess, the talks that I covered um, was the fact that they were trying to literally, I think the name of the talk was how to insert uh, progressive talking points into children's picture books. And they were they were literally saying one of the quotes that they gave, and it was a quote from someone that they admired, was that you need to be as close as possible to being underneath the bed clothes with that child with their flashlight reading the book so that you're whispering in their ear all of these progressive ideas. And that's what they, they were literally sitting there talking about. It, it wasn't hidden. This is what they wanted. This is what they were talking about. This is their strategy. And they all shook their heads and said, yes, yes, this is exactly what we need to be doing. And it, it is bizarre how much these people want to indoctrinate, especially the young. And again, I think Tolkien is a was at the very least a bulwark against that for a long, long time. Absolutely, it's it's crazy. You know, I watch a lot of kids entertainment now. Obviously, I got a, a six year old, a two year old, a newborn, so um, I get to watch a lot of things that are produced by Disney. Uh, in some of the other American companies, they all have a different feel to them. They're all essentially the same cartoon. They have the exact same message that they're going through, the exact same you know uh, set of friends, and they have the exact same set of diversity and everything. And they're not there to entertain. Whereas you know, uh, growing up, I remember you go to go to Sesame Street, you learn how to write or how to read, or you learn how to count, or maybe you learn a nursery rhyme. These uh, the new entertainment, specifically that's being produced and distributed by Disney via Disney Plus and uh, you know the Disney Channel. They're all aimed to influence your children, to teach them how to think and, and, uh, and, and to ascribe them into a new uh, worldview. It's crazy. I can go onto YouTube, and I think this is why YouTube, uh, and it's really dangerous what they're doing with YouTube with, with the censorship and everything. There's so much content on YouTube created for children, and it is specifically for entertainment and teaching. It's it's numbers. It, it's reading. It's it's writing. It's, it's uh, learning rhymes and stuff like that. And... My kids don't even watch Disney anymore. It's not a part of their their lives like it was uh, on mine. And, and I imagine maybe somebody, some other people's kids out there. They they we find good content on YouTube that's being created by by um, you know independent creators, and it's it's exactly what we're looking for. Without the influence, the, like the the psyop programs for children. I think uh, the internet although it has many, many problems, is going to be uh, the thing that saves most of our cultures. It's because we can connect just like you and I are connecting now, halfway across the world. And we're producing content that we know that other people want, even if it's for a small audience. Um, we know that there's someone out there that, that wants to hear what we have to say and that wants to listen to us because uh, we try to be, at the very least, honest. I mean, I'm not trying to 
deceive anyone with my videos. I'm trying to give them ideas that I come up with and think about. And whether they're right or wrong, I usually leave that up to my audience to 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 put that in the comments, whether you think you're I'm right or wrong. But I never tried to deceive. I'm always trying to be honest. And you're not going to get that honest content anywhere else, I don't think, anymore, <laughs> except for places like YouTube and especially smaller channels like yours and like mine. Um, and yeah, it is what is going to be the future of entertainment is a lot of these nooks and crannies like each of us are in and um, it's going to produce something that is for the audience. Uh, I think that is a missing and has been missing for decades, probably since at the very least the early nineties um, within a lot of entertainment or at the very least it, it began in the early nineties in comic books. Certainly um, it became less and less about entertainment and more and more about selling a message. Yeah, it's it's the weirdest thing, and you can't really escape it. That's what a lot about what my channel is about, and I imagine why you created your channel. I want other people to know they're not alone. It is crazy. There's a lot of weird stuff going on, and we can have honest takes, and we can we can talk about it, you know, within the framework of, of what you two uh, will allow will allow us to say, right? <laughs> that's exactly you're exactly right. That is one of the reasons why I created my channel, and one of the things that I did. Probably about a year after I started my channel, I did a lot of videos about um, this idea that, no, you're not alone. And that's why I started my channel to some extent, because I found other people and I realized that, no, all these things that I've been thinking about comics and about games and everything else, and I never found anyone in the real life around me because well, I live in places that are fairly scarce of population anyway, but I never found anybody around me who I could discuss these things with, let alone uh, explain these things to. But there are plenty of people out there. One of the one of the greatest tools that these people, this um, woke ideology has, is to make you think you are alone. It it literally they have a literal playbook um, that has been written. Uh, I think it was probably in the early '90s, saying that what you need to do is to isolate these people and make them feel alone. That is how you you get rid of their their systems that keep them in place that help them and that allow them to be who they are you isolate them and you destroy them one by one and uh, again i think the internet is the great connector now the the thing that shows us all that yeah there is something for you and you're not you're not alone and that was one of the big comments that i got on my videos when i started my channel it was that i have been thinking this for so long and finally someone has actually put it into words yeah i just Exactly. It's crazy. Doug and I, Doug Ernst and I just had a conversation. We were like, yes, they're trying to isolate you. They're trying to humiliate you into silence. If you're not silent, they're going to bully you into silence. If you can't bully you into silence, they're going to try and, and, and uh, affect your life, your ability to make money. If they can't do that, they will just try and cancel you and wipe you off the face of the earth. It, it is all part of a playbook. I, I think that, uh, quite honestly, um, as crazy as things have been over the last number of years, they're they're going to get much worse over the next four or five years. And that's why um, I'm trying at the very least to, I don't know, to get in contact with as many people as possible because it is together that all of us medium and small people, uh, channels and producers of content, we're actually going to get through this is because the censorship is just going to ramp up. And... Um, um, I think that us promoting each other and supporting each other is the only thing that's going to get us through it because the, certainly these um, corporations and YouTube and Google and everything else, they're going to at the very least shove us into a corner and hope that no one's going to listen to us and maybe if they can keep us down long enough, then they'll get rid of us. But um, yeah, cancel cancellation is in some places and to some people, especially play, places like YouTube, it's a slow process. It, it's not going to happen to you all at once for a lot of us smaller creators. And it's there, though. It, they're, they're trying to do that. And the only way that we can get through this is to band together, as far as I know. It's, an, it's a loose association, to say the least. It's just individuals um, coming together to realize that uh, we have other people around us and ready to support us. That was one of the things I found when I was publishing my book. A lot of people came to me and said, look, I don't really read graphic novels or comics, but I want to help support your work. Tell me how I can do that. And I was amazed that there were that many people out there that that wanted to actually help me out. And 
uh, I just can't thank them enough, but they're out there. So, so never feel alone. Absolutely. And that's why I like having these kind of conversations that I like to, to bring people on the channel. And we certainly covered a, a, a gamut of topics here. We didn't even get into the D and D stuff I wanted to get to, but we're at about 30 minutes now. I want to say thank you very much to RJ. You do Thomas Valiant is it, the initial campaign's over, but it's still available on Indiegogo, right? If people actually want to yes, read what a real hero is really all about. Yeah, um, it is still available on Indiegogo. The The name of the graphic novel is Thomas Valiant. I try to take the great story elements of um, comic books, and, and I, I would say the great story elements from the 80s, really, um, when you had people really understanding how comics were made and and bringing it into its own. Take that and combine it with a traditional hero and, um, and create a book. It's an 80-page book giant and it's for all ages um everyone can enjoy it and i want to give my audience exactly what they're asking for because i found that there's a lot of crowdfunded comics out there but not a lot of them are superheroes and uh, people were really really wishing for a superhero book and that's where i came in and i said this is what you want this is what i'm going to get you um there's a plenty of heroes that i can that I can do books about, but I'm going to do superheroes. And, and uh, if you're lacking that in your life, if you don't find a hero or a superhero story that you can connect to anymore, um, maybe you might want to come over and, and check out my book because I'm trying to, to give you the reader exactly what you want. That sounds amazing. There is a link in the video description. If you're interested in the project, if you weren't aware of it, I imagine most of my viewers actually have already gone over and supported the project. But if you were on the fence, now's the time. Uh, RJ, I know that you're still in production. How much longer is it looking before you think you'll you'll be able to start, uh, you know, ballparking the, uh, the fulfillment? Well, we are actually on track for fulfilling um, my original uh, – date for fulfilling the book and starting to get it out to people would be um, the end of December 1st of January uh, of next year. So the end of this year, uh, we are um, doing pretty good. I'm starting to uh, get the printers ready to do a lot of the pinup posters that come with it. There's six different pinup posters. One's a map. Uh, other ones came with um, different maps. parts of the book. Uh, there's a lot of different tiers, um, but there's also um, a 12 pack of cards and a lot of things that you can get with the book. So I have a lot of work ahead of me, but the major work is my artist, Renzo Rodriguez. He's an amazing artist and he gets better and better every day. Um, the thing is that I wanted to have a consistency with the art. And since he's doing all 80 pages, it's a lot of material for someone, especially since he works on other books at the same time he does. He's, he stops every once in a while. He works with, with uh, Richard Meyer over at Comics Matter uh, to do Impossible Stars. And uh, he has a number of other books on the go as well. So uh, that's why uh, we have such a long extended date until December to try to get this out to people. But I, at the same time, I'm working on the, the colors. I'm working on the um, th with the letterer and my cartographer and everything else. So it's a beautiful project. And it is so exciting to put this together for people who actually want to to support my work and to to hear a story about a, a traditional hero. Well, congratulations on the success. I hopefully uh, you you get some uh, even bigger numbers after after people discover it. Maybe here, uh, I really appreciate you coming on the channel. I hope we can do this again. It was a very uh, thoughtful conversation, and really the important thing is you are not alone. RJ's here, Wes is here. There's a lot of people out here, and we we see the same things you guys see. We might not agree on exactly all the details, but it's there, and, and we're we're not going to stop talking about. It. Yes, thank you very much. I would love to be on. Uh, it's just carving out the time to try to to talk to people because <laughs> I spend most of my free time trying to get my graphic novel ready because I do want to hit that date so that I get um, the book in the hands of people when I told them it would be there.